Welcome back to the Palin Thing Podcast Network. We're brought to you by Yakgadget for all your fine quality kayak fishing accessories. Go to yakgadget.com. Pelican cases, coolers, and lighting. Go to pelican.com. And the 153 Bait Company for all your hard and soft bait needs. Go to the 153angler.com. So join with me as together we dive into the tips and techniques that will help make us better anglers out on the water. Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of Bass Fishing for Noobs here on the Paddle and Fin Podcast. I am your host, Sean Lavery. Thank you again for joining me this evening. Um, well, tonight we're continuing on on our kind of back to the basics uh, series that I've been kind of working on. And tonight uh, uh, I was looking for a guest to talk uh, about uh, fishing line because um, that can definitely make or break uh, the techniques that uh, you're trying to learn. Uh, so I wanted to have a, a guest on, and I happened to uh, come upon, upon uh, Tim Moore when I was uh, doing some research, and I found an article that he had written uh, about line choice, and I reached out to him, and uh, he was gracious enough to uh, come on tonight with us. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Mr. Tim Moore. Welcome to the new show, sir. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure, Sean. No problem, man. Um, so uh, for any of the folks that who uh, aren't familiar with you, why don't you just uh, tell them who you are, uh, where you're from, and uh, kind of uh, your background in fishing, because it is pretty extensive. Sure. Uh, my name is Tim Moore. I am a full-time fishing guide in New Hampshire. I currently live in Barrington, New Hampshire. Uh, I grew up on the coast in Portland, New Hampshire, so I'm a, kind of a saltwater guy at heart, but have uh, migrated inland um, half my time inland and half my time on the salt these days. Um, and um, what got you into fishing or you've been fishing kind of your whole life? Yeah, it's just something, you know, we did. My dad fished. Um, so my family, uh, my dad's side of the family came to settle in Portsmouth. They came here from the Azores. And so fishing has just always been in the family. And I tell people I'm Portuguese and they're just like, you know, like a <laughs> Portuguese. And uh, so I get a good laugh, especially out of some of my Portuguese friends. And um, yeah, so it's fishing has just been something we did. You know, I, my grandmother actually raised me. My dad was always around, you know, so he would, you know, we spend weekends together hunting and fishing. And when I wasn't with him, um she, you know my grandmother she knew how to fish you know a little bit growing up on the wharf you know she was uh, her n nickname was blinks which when she was a kid which is a baby lobster because she spent okay. so much time on her father's lobster boat wow so, that's cool yeah so the ocean and fishing has has been in my family for quite a long time that's pretty neat um what kind of uh fishing do you guide for like uh what types of fish uh, are you targeting uh, so I guide in, in kayaks. I'm a member of the Old Town Pro Staff, so I guide in, in Old Town kayaks for stripers, and I do some smallmouth bass, bass trips. I live on a small lake uh, in Barrington, New Hampshire, that has no public access, so it has you know relatively decent, you know, giant smallmouth. But you know, I've I've um, talked to a neighbor that caught a six pounder. Okay, uh, but it's a pretty small. I don't remember how many acres it is. It's pretty small. Um, you know, some, some lakes uh, call it, it's called Nippo. Some, some lakes call it Nippo Lake and some uh, maps call it Nippo Pond. So it really is just a more of a big pond. Okay. Uh, there's some large mouth in there too. So I do some um, guiding there. I've done some, some guiding in kayaks um, and fishing for smallmouth up on Squam Lake, which if nobody's familiar with Squam Lake, the 1981 movie, I think it was, on Golden Pond was filmed on Squam Lake in New Hampshire. So Interesting. A lot of history up there, but it's a good smallmouth lake. And then I guide in my boat for um, lake trout and salmon and crappies. Cool. And I, I think you mentioned, mentioned um, that uh, while we were talking prior to starting the recording that uh, your seasons are starting to wind down a little bit, I guess, um, for this year. Uh, maybe have about a month left for some of the things. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the striper fall run still going on. I don't, I don't usually guide for striped bass and kayaks um, in the month of September, only because September is really good 
um, salmon trolling and lake trout jigging. It's just, it's just a phenomenal month for jigging lake trout on Winnipesaukee. And that's what I spend the bulk of my time. Most of my clients, you know, want to go up there and it's just really hard. I'll spend, you know, 10 days on Winnipesaukee and somebody wants to go fish for stripers. And I'm like, geez, I haven't fished in 10 days, you know, so it doesn't seem fair. So I stopped a couple of years ago. I stopped guiding for stripers in September, but there are still some fish around. It's been a tough season with all the rain. Uh, we've had a ton of rain here in New England. July was, I think, one of the wettest Julys on record uh, in August. And it, that went well into August. Lake Winnipesaukee is is 45,000 acres. And generally, uh, mid-August, we see about an average 15-inch low. It's 504 feet above sea level. And so that's, okay. considered, that's considered full. And we're usually about 15 inches below that, which is pretty typical for August between, you know, the, the dam. There's, there's a dam that only raised a level five feet, but it's a hydro dam. So they'll release water to generate power. And the lack of rain just from normal summers, we're about 15 inches low. And this year, mid-August, we were five inches high. Okay, wow. And that so, makes- yeah, the area that I guys stripers in is in the Piscataqua River, which is right at the entrance to Great Bay. And for those that are not familiar, Great Bay is the second largest inland estuary on the East Coast. It's 10 miles inland of the Atlantic Ocean, but it's 6,500 acres. Wow. That empties and fills twice a day, every day. And there are six major freshwater rivers that dump in there, though. So when, every time we get a lot of rain, two days later, it's just dumps in there and washes all the big fish out. And it literally looked like the color of root beer all summer. And it's just such a tough season that, you know, I just feel bad, you know, taking money from clients when I know that the fishing is going to suck. Yeah. That, that I mean, I'm gonna sure. It, yeah. It puts a hurting on your business too. I'm sure uh, it's hard to get repeat customers when, um, but I'm sure when you, they, they got to understand too um, that it's been a year probably I'm like, many others so yeah when i tell people that i don't suggest it i tell you know people inquire and if i don't recommend it i'll just tell them i don't recommend it you know just because the fishing's been off and i'll take you if you really want to go but i'm just being honest it's going to be tough and they're usually pretty grateful and they'll reschedule for the next year they'll say you know what what month should i go and i usually tell people june is a really good month okay typically as long as we don't get a lot of rain it's when the fish first show up and they're hungry and they're new and there's a lot more new fish coming all the time so now, when you say um, that it it fills and empties twice a day, is is that considered tidal fishing then, or okay? It is. Sometime yep. I'm going to have to have you back on to talk about that too, because that's one thing I've always wanted to understand and never had a really good explanation of uh, is fishing tidal waters like that. I mean, I've uh, fished it a little bit, like up and down the coast, like North Carolina and uh, uh, Maryland, Delaware, when we go on vacation. But I wouldn't say I have really any great. great grasp of when i should be going and when i shouldn't I, and i know there's a lot to it so yeah and it varies depending on you know what part of the country you're in you know being as north as we are we see tidal swings as six to eight foot tidal swings you know so it'll be you know eight feet deeper at high tide than it was at low tide you know you fish florida and they get like a 15 inch tide right there's a, a big tide and so, you know closer to get to the equator the, the smaller the tides are so, I remember uh, on my honeymoon, I went to the uh, Bay of Fundy in uh, in Canada, and uh-huh. uh, I forget what the tidal swing was, but all I know is when I got off the cruise ship, I walked down the plank, and when I got back on, I walked up the stairs. It was yeah. it was huge. Yeah, there are places like Alaska that see like twelve foot tides too. Really yeah, like that. the further away from you get the, from the equator, the the bigger your tides are going to be. Crazy, yeah. Well, cool, man. Well, um, uh, like like I said, when I introduced you, I, I kind of came across you when I was uh, researching the, the topic of fishing lines. Um, and I found an article that you had written for a publication. I can't remember off the top of my head what that publication was, but uh, uh, my uh, Facebook stalked you a little bit. And I was like, hey, I'm going to shoot him a message and see if he'd be willing to come on to talk about fishing lines. So. Sure. Yeah. Um, full disclosure, you know, I don't consider myself a bass fishing expert. I do guide for bass, so I guess I, I should consider myself a little bit of an expert, but, um, you know, we keep, I keep it simple, and I, I, I offer guided bass fishing trips when bass fishing is the easiest, you know, in May and June. Okay. Um, but, you know, I, and I, we, I do, you know, we do well, catch a lot of fish, and I do know a little bit, but I fish with some of my friends that fish tournaments and stuff, and they'll be switching out. They'll have specific rods and specific lines for specific baits. And I don't get quite that fancy, but 
fish the line, you know, I, I may have even mentioned in that article because it's it's kind of held true for me over the years. Your line is your only connection to the fish. Right. You can have, you know, you can have a seven hundred dollar spinning rod, and if you have an eight pound smallie attached to the other end of that line, with, you know, a two dollar spool of line, you're gonna get what you pay for. So, <laughs> a broken heart probably. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. Uh, no. So def yeah, um, that's fine. Uh, Cause I'm sure, you know, line choice has to pay, uh, you know, is important in all types of fishing, whether it's salmon or, you know, that kind of thing too. So um, I guess just to get started, um, I know in the article you talked about, you know, the main different kinds of line choices. Um, so we'll say, um, we'll start off with, I guess, would you start off with mono? Would you say that's the most kind of common for the beginner? Yeah. I would say so. Yeah. I mean, you go buy a pre-spooled rod combo at, you know, Walmart or your local tackle shop and it's going to have, most of the time it's going to have factory spooled will be mono. And that's what most people buy. It's what most people learn on. It's, it's easy. It's in effect, inexpensive and, and, and effective, but uh, it certainly has its drawbacks, you know, when you're fishing certain things. And one of the most, or two of the most important things that I usually tell people of monofilament is that it stretches more than any other fishing line. And it absorbs water over time. So it will actually begin to sink the longer you fish with it. So if you're fishing top water over time, you know, that monofilament could will will tend to sink um, and could pull your pull your lures down a little bit. Interesting. Interesting. I I think I mean I've I heard about using mono for top water um, um, for the reason that it floats. And it's interesting to hear that uh, that it does absorb water over time. I don't think I knew that. Um, I always assumed that it would pretty much float the whole time or most of the time. Uh, yeah. Interesting. Um, yeah, just a stretch factor. Um, you know, growing up on the salt, uh, <clears throat> I remember being deep sea fishing with my dad. You know, he, he's a lot of his friends fished straight 50 pound monofilament on their cod fishing setups. And he would fish Dacron with about a, which is just a braid, you know, heavy braid. Okay. He fits like 80 pound dac Dacron with a 50 pound monofilament leader and he would catch he'd outfish all of his buddies on the boat and so one day he tied a they tied a, a 16 ounce norwegian jig onto one of the one of the rods with monofilament on it and at 180 feet they measured 22 inches of stretch or 20 inches of stretch before that lure even started to move that's crazy 180 feet of mono 50 pound monofilament you know, versus, you know, Dacron or, you know, now we use a lot of braided lines, um, mm -hmm. a little more high-tech braid with no stretch. So that's one of the huge advantages to monofilament or braid versus monofilament. But better sensitivity and no stretch isn't always the best thing. Sometimes you need a shock absorber. You know, when I fish for crappies in the fall, I fish, I fish monofilament because we want that stretch. We fish light line and their mouths are so thin and so sensitive that if you fish braid with a leader – fluorocarbon leader there's almost no stretch there and, and you'll you have to really be careful and especially with clients that don't fish a lot monofilament is the key to um to hook up success and keeping those fish on because it offers some stretch and some shock absorption and same thing with trolling uh, my downrigger rods i know a lot of people run straight braid they like the sensitivity of the braid i like the shock absorption you know we're running two and a half miles an hour two to two and a half most of the time pulling lures when a fish hits those and that I run a um, 12 pound monofilament on my main line, then I run up 50 feet of fluorocarbon and that, that main line will act as a little bit of a shock absorber too. And it's preference, you know, like I said, a lot of people prefer braid and maybe it's what they learned on. Maybe it's, they had, you know, a good day and it's like, like a, any lure you gain confidence in it. And that's what a lot of people will tend to stick with. But those are the things to remember with, with monofilament is do you want stretch or no stretch? And when I say absorbs water, it, they, it does take quite a while for them to absorb water. And I don't think most, most bass anglers don't experience that because they switch rods so often, <laughs> you know, that their line, everything has a chance to kind of dry out a little bit and nothing really gets too waterlogged. But yeah, that is something to remember if you're, if you're fishing, you know, if, if all you do is fish top water, you might want to stick with something that floats a little better. Right. So uh, pros for mono would be it's cheap. Um, yep. and, um, I guess, uh, line stretch if you want it, 
Um, so like you said, there's some baits depending on like, I know I've heard potentially um, treble hook baits, you know, it, it will let the, let you have a little bit more play and allow the fish to, you know, fight a little bit, you know, maybe wear them down a little bit more than, you know, just, it, it depends, I guess, if you're, if you have a moderate action rod, that's going to allow you to fight a little bit too, uh, without, uh, but if you have like a broomstick rod, then you, you might want a little bit of line with some stretch in it, but, but definitely yep. the downsides are again, that it stretches. And, uh, like you said, I guess, uh, after, some time that it will absorb water and, and lose that floating ability. So, yeah. And it's also uh, the con with monofilament is that the refractive index is it does bend light. That's why most people go to fluorocarbon. It's less stretch, but most people will, will choose fluorocarbon uh, because it has almost the same refractive index. So monofilament will bend light. Okay. Uh, whereas fluoro has this almost the same refractive index as water, I should say. So it doesn't bend light. So it, it's almost invisible to fish. So, you know, when a, like when, like when a Pisaki, I don't know very many fit people that fish monofilament because the water's crystal clear and okay. there's, there's a ton of, of light penetration in that water and monofilament does refract, does bend light. So it tends to show up more to those, okay. you know, fish that are highly pressured and when they get line shy. Most people will fish, either straight fluoro or braid with a fluorocarbon leader to avoid the, the, you know, the visibility of fluoro of uh, monofilament. Okay. Yeah, no, I was just going to say that, that, uh, if you're looking for, uh, or fishing in crystal clear water, you almost are forced to go to fluorocarbon at that point, or at least a fluoro leader because, uh, um, yeah, definitely fish are going to be a little more line sensitive at that point. Whereas down here in PA where I am, most of our water isn't super clear, uh, especially right now with all the rain and stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, our water clarity is just finally starting to come back a little bit. Uh, I fish the Susquehanna River. It's about 15 minutes from my house. And, uh, you know, normally this time of summer, it is pretty crystal clear. But right now with, you know, the hurricane rains and the flooding and everything that we've had recently, it's just now getting relatively back to some level of clarity um but definitely not clear yet uh i was out yesterday and i think i had maybe two foot of visibility max so which you know normally i can usually see at least five feet uh, most of the time but so uh all right so that's mono um we, we talked about flora a little bit so i guess that might be a good next step um so pros and cons of fluoro. Um, well, pros are the visibility or lack of for fish. You know, it, like I said, it has this almost the exact same refractive index as water. So it, it basically virtually disappears in water, especially to fish. Uh, it has less stretch than mono. So if you're looking for sensitivity, you don't want to run braid. Uh, fluorocarbon is certainly a good option. It does sink. Um, so, you know, depending on, on what you want it to do, um, you know, how you're going to fish it, you may not want to fish it. That's why I think a lot of people will fish um, braid to fluoro if they need, um, they need to um, hide their line a little bit from those, you know, from line shy fish. They'll, they'll run braid to, to uh, fluoro cons, I would say. Um, well, it pro is, it's pretty, most of, most fluorocarbon is pretty abrasion resistant resistant but once you do get a nick or a fray or a hot spot in it it's almost sure to break when you put put it under pressure like any you know you you'll see me my clients will will ask me after a while if of vertical jig and lake trout every fish that comes in before i drop their lure back in the water for them I take my hand and i run it down the leader to the lure you know 18 inches or so and just feel it because they'll the lake trout will twist up and they'll get the line will wrap around their face and through their mouth and they'll nick that fluorocarbon. If there's any nick in there, I just break it. I just cut it right off and retie, you know. And they're always like, "What? What are you? What are you doing? It wasn't broken." And I'm like, "Yeah, I had a little tiny nick. I could feel in it." And it's, you know, your line's never going to break on a on a two pound fish. It's always going to break on a ten pound. <laughs> you need every bit of the line's capability. So it's if you get do get a nick or a fray in fluorocarbon. You know, it, it's it's more expensive, so I think people will tend to try to push their luck a little bit because they don't want to. And it's also, you know, depending on what knot you use, it's a, it can be a pain in the neck 
to tie that leader to braid connection. And so a lot of people, if they haven't got a, a knot down really well, then they'll, they might resist retying, but if it gets a fray or a nick or even a hot spot, you know, and one of the keys with tying knots in fluorocarbon is to wet it, you know, a little bit of saliva. I've heard of some people carrying chapstick. I've, I read a lot. I've read more about it than I've ever seen it. I don't, I don't see anybody that actually uses chapstick to lubricate their knots. Most people just, you know, put a little saliva on it and slide the knot down. But it's definitely, I mean, you take a fluorocarbon knot and cinch that thing tight without any lubrication and then give it a good yank, it's going to snap almost every single time. Just the, the heat, that the friction of tightening that knot down will weaken the fluorocarbon. It does get weak pretty fast and I do a lot of vertical jigging, so or striper fishing in around the rocks and smallmouth fishing in around the rocks. And I go through a ton of leader material in the spring when I run smallmouth trips because they're right in the rocks. You know, right. and if they're not, and if they're not, they take you right into the rocks. And we go through a pile. And there's rock bass, which do a number on it. They they're always running the leader around down, you know, running your lure around in the rocks down there and fraying up leaders. And, so. I, uh, it's definitely something I've, I've had to learn the hard way over the years. Cause I, uh, not so much that I would, didn't know how to tie the knots, but I was just lazy. I would even, I'd run my hand up and down. I'm like, ah, that doesn't feel too bad. And I'd end up paying for it. Um, so, uh, they're definitely something I, I kind of learned, um, uh, you know, relatively quickly was that, uh, if you have any question or doubt about, uh, a nick you should retie uh, cut and retie because uh, yeah you're gonna pay for it eventually if you don't um, but uh, one thing I was wondering about uh, that I'd heard and kind of experienced a little bit was line memory uh, would you say fluoro is better or worse than mono uh, with line memory um, it's come a long way you know traditionally I think the the ID the impression was that it had more memory than monofilament. Um, I think a lot of the a lot of the fluorocarbons that are available today, they've come so far with them that they have a lot less memory. They're softer than they've ever been. I mean, you know, I use the Daiwa J fluoro, and I've had such amazing luck with that stuff. That, you know, it'll have a little bit of memory, and within you know, the first couple of minutes of fishing it, and it's the loops are all gone, and then it you know comes right out of it. So, you know, you can you get what's paid for. I was just gonna say that, uh, you know, when you said there's lots of different types out there, I I wholeheartedly agree that you definitely get what you pay for. And uh, I've I've tried lots of different kinds now, and and the cheaper stuff definitely does tend to have a little bit more memory. And um, but if you buy, you know, anywhere from moderate to expensive uh, fluoro, uh, I don't think uh, line memory is a problem so much anymore. Um, especially, like I use mostly mostly fluorocarbon for, fluorocarbon for leader material. And at that point, it's such a short uh, distance of it. Like I usually do uh, double my rod length is usually my leader yeah. length. Um, uh, and then I kind of, as I cut and retie, I, you know, whittle it down until I, if I get to start getting down to around like four to five feet, I'll just cut it off and retie a new double rod length on. Yep. Same here. Cool. All right. So, uh, for fluorocarbon pros are that it sinks, which I was going to talk about, like, uh, if you're throwing crankbaits or stuff, uh, I've heard like Kevin Van Dam saying, uh, you know, fluorocarbon's best for that kind of thing because it'll allow you to get the maximum depth out of your crankbaits and, and stuff like that. Um, I've never run straight fluoro before, um, uh, uh, more for budget wise than anything else. But uh, um, I, 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 I'm curious to try it and I probably will at some point on my crankbait rod just to see uh, what the difference is. Um, right now I still run braid to leader even on my crankbait rod. So um, I just tend to maybe make the leader length a little bit longer on that. Uh, just to make casting a little easier. Yep, same here. I don't. The only rods that so I run pretty much exclusively run braid to the floral leader on everything except my ice fishing rods and the my fall crappy fishing rods, which are ultralights with you know just like uh, I think I have six pound monofilament on those. So like I said, I want that little bit of stretch. 
Um, and the, the area where I crappie fish is of Lake Winnipesaukee is, is actually a little bit more stained, so we don't have to worry about line clarity as much. And are you mostly vertical fishing for crappie at that point? Or are you? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, because I, I think when you take kind of the casting out of it, you know, then you really, there's some things that you aren't as worried about uh, if you don't have to worry about casting distance and stuff like that. So. Yep. Yeah, I, I just, I really like the sensitivity of braid. Uh, you know, I'm kind of the black sheep in my in my fishing circle because I don't fly fish. I, okay. I've done it enough to know how much I dislike it. <laughs> and the reason I dislike it, I actually had a client say this, and it, I, you know, I've, I've tried to explain to people what I don't like it, and I've never really been able to come up with a, a way that best describes it, but the thing I like most about fishing is that connection to the fish, feeling the bite, setting the hook, feeling every, you know, I mean, I was jigging Lake Trout this morning in 130 feet of water and you could literally feel it when my, when my lure would, I would drop down and it would bounce off the top of a fish. Cause they're just, they're stacked right now. There's hundreds of fish down underneath you, you know, every day. And you could literally feel it bouncing off the top of these fish as it, as it goes down through them. The difference between like, that was a bite and that was just bounced off of one. Like, that's why I like braid, you know, and that's, that's, so I fish it. I like that connection. You know, it's just a preference thing for me. It, it makes fishing more fun. So almost, almost everything I do is, is braid to floral leader, except like I said, ice fishing, uh, I run mono on my ice fishing rods. We're in 30 feet or less. And then in for crappie and through the ice and, uh, and then for crappies, you know, monofilament, but. Interesting. It's just so me. when you, I've never caught a fish on a fly rod. I've, I've went to casting demonstrations and stuff and casted them. So what's different about fly fishing then? You you den generally don't feel the bite. You're just watching for line movement. Or I, think, I mean, I, I'm, I'm not I, by no means. I think I fly fish three, three times. I've had three friends try to teach me because they all believe that it was just I didn't have the right teacher. So they try it. And they usually send me for my spinning rod within like 30 minutes. <laughs> One of them, the last time, he said, he was just standing there staring at me. And I said, what? We've been fishing for like 30 minutes. And he said, you look miserable, number one. And number two, you haven't had a fly on the end of your line for like 20 minutes. <laughs> he said, like, that, that cracking noise that you hear when you're back cast, it's not supposed to happen. And you whip the fly right off. So um, I, I, from what I gather and what they try to teach me is there is a lot of sight to it. You're watching your line. You're watching your rod tip. Um you're watching the fly, you're watching the water, reading the water. I mean, it's definitely, don't get me wrong, I don't take anything away from the art, you know, and the skill level involved in fly fishing. It is, you know, it's it's mastery. You know, it's definitely, there's something to be said. You can't take anything away from a, a skilled fly fisherman or someone that loves it to begin with, but um, it's just not for me. I, right. you know, I love to feel the bite. It's sort of like, uh, I'm a hunter and I turkey hunt and people ask me why I don't bow hunt for turkeys, you know, cause I, I'm known for, I used to guide for turkeys and I'm known for putting my decoys like 25 yards in front of my blind and people are like 25 yards, you're going to reach 50, 60 yards. I'm like, yeah, I like it when they're in close. And they're like, why don't you bow hunt for them? And I say, cause I like shooting them. You know, mm -hmm. it's, sort of, it's like setting the hook on a fish for me, you know, setting the hook on a fish is, is, you know, the same thing as pulling the trigger on a turkey. It's just that excitement level. Every single time I do it, it never gets old. Right. No, I, I feel you there. Uh, I've, I've hunted for Turkey a few times, uh, never successfully. So, um, I've had, you know, just the rush of hearing one gobble <laughs> relatively close by. Um, yeah. but, um, but no, I, I mean, you like what you like and I yeah. like, like you said, it's not to take anything away from fly fishermen. I, it's something I will try eventually. Um, I just don't have the time to devote to, you know, I'm, I have enough trouble mastering regular fishing at this point. So, I don't need to up the degree of difficulty yet. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I, like I said, sometime, you know, I, it's definitely something I want to try, but at this point uh, I'm not quite there yet. So no, yeah. no hard feelings. I don't think so. So cool. I guess, uh, so we talked about mono, we talked about floral. Um, we've kind of been going back and forth about braid, but you know, so benefits of braid. Um, we talked about increased sensitivity, um, no stretch, zero stretch. So, you know, and I, and that's why uh, I've heard it. It's good for uh, pitching and flipping. 
uh, that kind of thing. Um, what other techniques? Uh, you don't do, generally do spray, straight braid on anything, right? You're braid to flora. I am. Um, I do know some Winnipesaukee anglers, even in that clear water that runs straight braid, depending on, on what they're fishing. Um, my rods are pretty much always going to already have um, fluorocarbon leader on them. Mm -hmm. And I go through so much fluoro that there is a point that, you know, I'm like, I can't throw another 10 foot of fluorocarbon away just to run straight braid on this lure. We're going to run fluorocarbon leaders, you know, and as long as clients are catching fish, I don't, I don't give it too much more thought than that. And I don't fish tournaments. So there aren't tens of thousands of dollars at stake or hundreds of dollars at stake. You know, it's my clients and they want to catch fish. And as long as we're putting them on fish, I try not to overthink it, you know, too, too much. But um, another advantage is definitely castability of braid. Absolutely. Um, question for you. What color braid do you use? Uh, I'm wondering, I'm curious about what color braid people would use in clear water. Uh, like I know for me, I generally on like my spinning rods and stuff, if I have a long enough leader, I will use the high vis stuff just so I can see my line a little bit yep. better. Um, but I've seen a lot of people around here that use the like moss green stuff and uh, you know, the, the darker colors as well. Yeah. I think that moss green is just common. You know, when power pro first came out, it was green. You know, and most of the power pros are, are green and there's some colors that have been added to it now. But, um, you know, I tell my clients the fluorocarbon is for the fish. The braid is for the fishermen. And so I run that. I run uh, Daiwa J braid X8 Grand. I love that line. And I run the gray because I can see it. Um, you know, the inside of my um, my personal uh, PDL is gray, dark gray. So I can see that light gray against it so I can tie knots. I'm. I turned 49 this year, so uh, my eye doctors said, you're going to need readers pretty soon, someday. I wear contacts, you know, yep. most of the time. And so you might want to get some readers, you know, for tying fishing knots and stuff. And I was like, I don't know about that. But um, <laughs> that, so, you know, I do like, I like that gray. I can see it in the water. Um, and it's just, it's, it's different for me. So it, it stands out. So I've been fishing that light gray j braid but they make it in uh i think they have it in a green i can't remember what colors blue i've seen some blue braid uh, but yeah so I'm, I'm starting to gravitate more towards high vis colors just because i can i can see them um i but you know so with my knots my you know leader to braid knots i don't really need to be able to see my line as much as i do like with um like monofilament you know i've gone to more like golds and yellows and monofilament so that I can see them because it's getting hard, especially ice fishing. You know, I fish a lot of like three contest line. And when your hands are cold and the wind's blowing and it's, you get a white background from the ice, it's tough to see three contest line. It's tough for me too. I can't see it like I used to. Right. No, I'm so, in the same boat. I'm, I'm 44, but uh, the doctor, eye doctor is our also said I'm wearing contacts right now. And she was saying, you know, Readers might not be too far away. I think my uh, the power on my right eye contact is about as high as it can go. She's like, you're not going to get much higher. So if your prescription gets much worse, you might be uh, uh, either doing one of those hybrid contacts with like the built-in bifocals or something. But uh, I have yeah. yet to cross that bridge, but uh, it's it's probably relatively close in my near future. So I yeah. definitely hear you there. So um and bringing that up, though, it's a good point that uh, one of the another benefit of braid is the uh, diameter is smaller than um, fluoro. You get the same strength or more for relatively less diameter uh, line diameter, so you can fit more on your spool. Um, like you said, castability is good. Uh, we talked about no stretch. Um, braid floats, uh, I think, for the most part, right? Yeah, until the air comes out of it. Okay. Yep. Depending on the braid. Okay. You know, when we, when we um, so we've, I do a lot of vertical jigging for lake trout right now this in September. <clears> and <throat> when you drop down for the first time, the, you could, we could see our jigs on the, on the fish finder. I use spot lock in my boat or in my kayak. I have, I have an autopilot with spot lock and you'll nice. see all the, all the bubbles coming off of your braid when you first drop it down there. Wow. So, okay. You know, once the air comes out, but that's, you know, hundred feet down. Okay. Okay. I've never actually heard that. That's interesting. I've always just assumed that it's wet and, you know, but that makes sense. 
And it's cool. Yeah, so, that, that's cool. You can actually see that on your fish finder. That's pretty neat. Yeah, yeah. It'll uh, it, sometimes it'll it'll attract fish too. Those bubbles coming off that braid, it'll come in to see what what's going on. But like I said, that's deep water. There's a lot of pressure down there, so that'll push <clears> that water into the braid, push the air out. Okay. And you know, in shallower water, when we're casting for bass and stuff, it does it does tend to float. Okay. Cool. Um, so I, I know some people, at least around here, I've heard, um, I've talked to quite a few people and some people for top water actually prefer braid over, uh, anything else. Um, I still tend to do braid to a lower a leader. Sometimes on top water, I'll do mono, uh, just for mm -hmm. the floating, at least a little bit more floating than fluorocarbon. Um, but I usually don't do uh, a couple of guys I talked to are like, oh, you should do straight braid for top water. And every time I do that, if I'm working like a, a walking bait, I always get the line wrapped around the hooks. Almost every time when I'm walking the dog, I, I don't know if it's bad technique or what, but I almost always end up, uh, you know, getting the braid all wrapped around my hooks. And yep. uh, so that's why I've kind of stuck to uh, even on my topwater stuff using a at least a mono or, or sometimes even a fluorocarbon leader, depending on what I'm throwing if I just tied it on one of my regular rods and don't have a top water specific rod out with me. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Same with me. Um, that, I, you know, one of the things that I like about, so most of my, most of my spinning reels will have, um, 30 pound braid on them. And I can, that way I can just change out my leaders and I can, you know, I can fish for stripers with those. I can fish for bass with those rods. I can fish for vertical jig for lake trout and just adjust my leaders accordingly. That's why I was saying, you know, earlier, like, I don't, I, you know, sometimes I get into a situation where I was striper fishing yesterday with, you know, 20 pound fluorocarbon leaders. And then today I'm fishing for bass or lake trout with eight pound. And I've got to throw those 20 because, you know, yeah, you know, if I was, uh, if I had more time and patience and discipline, I could find a way to save those leaders and wrap them around a pool noodle or something to reuse them later on. But that's, you know, wishful thinking. I don't, I coil them up. And then I forget about them and then I find them and they've been sitting in the sun or they're just, you know, don't look usable or they've been coiled so tight for so long and now in the sun, in the heat, you know, I've left my tackle box in my truck or in my boat in the sun and, and, and I don't. So, um, I, I, I will change out leaders quite a bit, but I like the fact that, you know, I can go, you know, the, I think the, the thinnest leaders that I run are eight pounds which are about the same diameter as 30 pound braid. So it, it goes up from there. If I'm fishing 12 pound leaders, I get a little bit of that stiffness that definitely, especially even vertical jigging prevents a lot of foul hooking and casting top water for stripers. We do a lot of top water for stripers and smallies and suspended jerk baits. And sometimes even just cat while they cast, you know, they'll, if you don't, if you don't lob them just right, they'll, you know, I'll get excited and try to whip one out there as fast as I can. And next thing you know, it's, it's, you know, it's tumbling through the air and it's got line wrapped around it. And I think the stiffer, you know, fluorocarbon leader helps prevent that. Definitely. Definitely. Um, all right. So um, the only other line that I have regularly heard of is copolymer. Have you ever had much uh, experience with that? I, f I fished uh copolymers <clears throat> through the ice for a number of years um up until so clam outdoors is one of my is my main ice fishing sponsor and two years ago they came out they went to sunline and had sunline make a, a whole line of monofilaments fluorocarbons uh, but before that i fished um well, i can't remember the name of the line it's, it was a copolymer and i really liked it and i might Hang on one sec. I might have a spool of it right here left over. Okay. Yep. Uh, I fished pea line, fluoro ice. It's a copolymer. I was just going to say, uh, Brian, uh, one of the other uh, kind of the OG uh, of the paddle and fin crew, um, he fishes a lot of pea line, and I know he, he likes it a lot. Uh, I tried it based off of his uh, suggestion. And I didn't like it as much. Um, I thought it had a little bit more stretch than I really wanted. And um, I, I probably didn't give it its due uh, time. Um, I lost, I uh, just, I think I tried it on a wacky rig or something. And just, I could feel just because I was so used to throwing a fluoro leader 
um, and I was throwing the the P line as my leader, and I could tell a difference in the in the stretch. Um, just retrieving it, I uh, I didn't feel like the it was the same sensitivity that I had with my fluorocarbon. So I bailed on it pretty quick, but um, I definitely know a lot of people who who do like it, like Brian. He uses a ton of it. So yeah. Yeah, my only experience with it is through the ice, and I do luck with it, you know, for the years that I used it. Um, that sun line is a really good line, so I've been using that the last couple of years. I um, was happy that they went with it. And it's. I also ran into a, a situation where um, it wasn't IGFA rated. So I actually I caught a, a line class world record white perch through the ice with the P line, and it. I sent a section of the line in, um, I'll hold my hands up. You can't see them, but I sent the section of the line in like you have to, to register that, that record. And when they tested it, it broke higher than it was rated for. Yeah. Um, and so the, the sun line that I use now is IGFA rated. So regardless of, you know, diameter or whatever, it's all, it's all tested out and to, to break. So that's one of the reasons that I got away from, with it because with, it, with IGFA, if you register, like mine was a four, was the four pound class line test, I believe. And if it, if your line tests out higher, then they automatically enter you into the next category. But for me, the five pound fish was heavier um, or the next category up, whatever it was, I can't remember, was heavier. So I, I missed that record. Gotcha. That stinks. Yeah. I, I don't I don't think I ever heard about that part of, uh, you know, the record process. Is that something that's New Hampshire specific or? No, that's IGFA regulations. So okay. if you submit a, a line class, uh, record to them you have to submit a section of a tippet or a leader okay but you actually have to submit the lure with i think it's two feet of line still attached to the lure interesting and then they they test it to see make sure it breaks to if you're entering it in a line class category so i was in the four pound class category i, I believe is what it was and it broke higher than four pounds so i got you so that's more in in a line class uh record then that makes sense yeah you would if you're you know obviously if it's a four pound line class then you want to make sure that you're using uh line that, yeah matches yeah. up with that yeah okay now that makes a lot more sense i was like hmm, interesting i i was always worried about other things with uh catching ret record fish i don't think i ever would have thought about that but that makes a lot of sense yeah it's an igfa it's something you you know you don't really think about i never thought about it until i was like you know there's this four four pound um test line class record for white perch and we have fish that are as big as that record doesn't mean the fish is four pounds it just means the largest one caught on four pound test right we catch fish like that all the time so i know i can break that record and so i happened that you know that one one year once i got that idea in my head that's pretty much all i thought about and so i finally caught one that was bigger and submitted it and the line didn't qualify for four pound test so i did not get the record most of the time, I've had you know some state records and stuff, and they're they're all just happenstance. I'm, you know, I just happen to fish and catch one that'll qualify, so I submit it. I'm not a record hunter by any means. Still, though, if you if you know you're regularly catching bass or uh, fish that will break the record, you know right. it's worth taking a shot at getting your name yep. in the books. So. Absolutely. Cool. Cool. Um, all right. So copolymer, um, uh, it kind of it it they sell it as the best of both worlds that, you know, uh, it, uh, I guess, uh, it does have a little bit more line, uh, uh visibility than fluorocarbon. Uh, it's more like mono at that point. Cause basically what it is, it's fluorocarbon wrapped in, or mono wrapped in fluorocarbon. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. That's, that's my understanding of it as well. So you're going to have a little bit more line visibility, but, um, I guess uh, strength or abrasion resistance might be better. Yeah. Uh, so um, if you're in the market to try it, you can't hurt to try it. Um, are there any other kind of lines that I've misplaced? I know Tippet is one, but I mean, most of, at least I don't know many people who bass fish, you know, that's more of a fly fishing thing in my mind. Yeah, no, I can't help you with that <clears throat> one. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's that's a different show. Someday we'll have a, a fly fishing expert on, and he'll explain that to me. I know the basics of it—that it's a tapering line and that kind of thing. But uh, 
yeah. that's, that's about the extent of my, my knowledge about it. But so those are the four that you would think of off the top of your head. Yeah. Yep. For sure. Cool. Um, now, uh, one of the questions I had was, um, do you change knots depending on the different types of line that you're using or do you relatively use mostly the same knots? No, I, I, um, I change knots depending on how lazy I am that day. <laughs> um, and that's the, it, well, it's to a degree, uh, depending on how lazy I am and, and what I'm doing. I, so my braid to floral knot, my favorite is the FG knot. Okay. I love that knot. It is a pain in the neck to tie. Um, you know, I've done hundreds of them and every single time I have to do it, I'm like, ah, here we go. It's just, you know, you have to get the tension on your braid just right. can't be too much tension, but it has to be some tension. And it's just, you know, it can be a pain in the neck and it's time consuming. You know, you have 21 wraps, you know, one line in your teeth and you're trying to see what you're doing. And my eyesight isn't that good close up anymore. So it's, it's not, it's not as much fun. I can tie a double uni knot with my eyes closed. I don't even have to look when I yeah. tie those. If I'm casting, I will, I will bite the bullet and tie that FG knot because it goes through the guides. You can't even hear it go through the guides. It right. casts really, really well and smooth, and my knots don't get beat up. A well, uni, the uni, you can cast it; it'll go through the knot through the guides. You'll hear it go through the guides, but after you know, reel, casting it and reeling it back and forth through the guides after a while, it does get pretty beat up. But vertical jigging, you know, if we're in a hurry and you know the lake trout bite, or you know we're jigging for smallmouth or whatever. And the bite's good, and I need to tie a leader on really quick, and we're not casting. I go right for that double uni knot because it's good and strong, and uh, it takes less a lot less time. I can tie it much faster than I can tie an FG knot. And if I if I rush an FG knot, it will pull out. It's just you know I don't know what it is I'm doing when I when I rush it, but you know it will either I'll have a tough time getting it to cinch down, or it'll pull out on a fish. It'll you know I'll think I got broke off, and I reel it in, and there's there's my you know, the FG not tied in the end of the braid with, with the fluorocarbon just pulled right out of it. So it's, it's not that I have to tie when, when I have time to tie it. So the uni, the uni is a, is a good, you know, it's a, I call it a utility knot. It's a good, strong knot that holds up well, lubricate the knot really well. So it doesn't damage the fluorocarbon and, you know, and, and you should be good for most applications. It's an easy knot to learn. That is the knot that I use for the most part. Occasionally, if I'm tying knots the night before, um, I'll tie a uh, Alberto knot for my uh, leader knot, uh, just because yep. it is smaller. Um, it's not as crazy as the FG knot. I've attempted to try that. I have yet to tie it successfully, um, <laughs> but I've <laughs> I've done uh, a bunch of the uh, Alberto knots successfully. Like I said, I'll, I'll tie that the night before uh, if I'm going out, um, but on the water, I almost always tie a double uni just because I know I can do it. I can do it quick. And for the most part, it lasts. I've had times where eventually the knot did break going through the line or my, on, when I, on my casting rod, especially if you have micro guides. Uh, yeah. it, it, it can tend to um, be an issue then. <clears throat> yeah. But, my issues with the FG knot are always pulling it too tight, usually. You know, they teach you, you watch the tutorials and they tell you, you know, you'll pull tension on the braid and then wrap the floor around that, make your wraps. So I would, you know, I just, I'm a, I'm a more is better kind of guy. If, if a little bit of the tension is good, then even more is probably better. And that's not the case at all with that FG knot. You need to be able to, you want that braid to kind of, um, kind of uh, wrap in with the fluorocarbon as you make your wraps. So just enough tension to hold it tight is I found to be the key with that FG knot. So you can get the two wrap, two lines to kind of wrap around, even though you're only wrapping one, it's kind of wrapping the braid in into the fluorocarbon when you do it. And it should bite down pretty well that way. I always have trouble keeping my wraps from overlapping, you know, yeah, yeah. Uh, and that's, that's my biggest challenge with the FG knot for sure. But uh, one of these days I'll, I'll actually take the time to get halfway decent at it. I've watched a million videos. I've watched the kind where they say, oh, you got to hold this in your teeth and hold this with this. And one guy's like, oh, no, you you shouldn't have to hold anything in your teeth, you know, do it this way, you know. Yeah. And um, I've tried a lot of different videos. I uh, have yet to find one that helps me tie it successfully. But like I said, the Alberta knot uh, is kind of my standby until I get good at that. Uh, and that seems to work for me for the most part. It does it's not as small, I don't think, uh, uh, but it is smaller than the double uni. So 
uh, tends to work a little bit better for me on, I use that on the rods that I have micro guides on. Most everything else, I just tie a, a double uni in because um, I know I can do it quickly. And, yeah. you know, for the most part, it's pretty solid and secure. Yeah. <clears throat> All right. Um, so that by the only other question I was going to ask you, um, I know you kind of yeah. talked a little bit about it, but uh, what kind of lines do you, uh, uh, what kind of brands do you, do you use most? And, um, if you're sponsored by them, that's cool too, whatever, whatever you guys use. Um, so the last couple of years, the last two years, I've, I just, so I, I fished a lot of different lines for a long time. I fished Power Pro for years because it was just kind of a staple in the industry. And I, you know, I, I tried uh, Daiwa Samurai for a while, but um, I found it to be, um, it would fray in the rocks a lot easier. It's such a, it's such a thin and it's really expensive and it's, it's a really good line. It's so with braids, the most basic braids are either four carrier or eight carrier, four strand or eight strand. And a four strand is going to be more of a flat profile. So it's really good for vertical jigging, but not as good for casting. And an eight strand will be round. So it casts, that's what makes it so soft. And so like thread like, is that it's it's round and softer um, so i've been going with an eight strand for the last few years and that's what that samurai was the first eight strand braid that i ran but i like i said i just had some trouble with it fraying i do a lot of vertical jigging and, and it would fray in the rocks and stuff so i got away with it but then i was introduced to that daiwa j braid x8 grand it's called and i've had the same line on reels a couple of my two of my reels have had the same line for two summers now we're just winding down the second summer and it looks like it's brand new um i love it it's really soft um i've i go with the light gray because i can see it see it pretty well and um i've been running the j fluoro i ran you know cigar for years before that i got um i got a bunch of the um, j fluoro from from daiwa so i've been you know, just running out on everything because I have so much of it and I've had good luck with it. I haven't had any, any issues with it at all. And in through the ice, I, like I said, I run all of that um, frost line is from clam is what I run through the ice just because it's, it's good line. It's all IGFA rated and they have a whole line of monofilaments and fluorocarbons. But like I said, the blue, I ran Seagar Blue Label. They came out with a line this year that a friend of mine, a leader material this year, I can't remember what it's called, but a, a friend of mine, that's a guide, a charter captain on for stripers has been running it. Said it's really, really good stuff. So a lot of really good fluorocarbons. Fluorocarbon is the one thing that, or not the one thing, but one of the things in the fishing industry that kind of holds true to that. You get what you pay for. You buy cheap fluoro, you're going to get cheap fluoro. Mm -hmm. You know, um, in the tattoo industry, they say cheap tattoos aren't good and good tattoos aren't cheap. The same thing goes for uh, fluorocarbon. fluorocarbon. Yeah. Right. Yeah, for sure. Um, I've been, you know, kind of standardized on Seaguar now for a little bit, but I, I will definitely check out the the Daiwa stuff because uh, I'm always looking for, you know, other stuff. I um, have a few large spools of Seaguar, you know, once I decided, you know, that I liked it and it seemed pretty quality stuff. Uh, I, you know, got some of the bigger spools so that I wouldn't have to buy it as often. Um, but um, But definitely I'm always looking for, other things to try. So I will check out the J braid, uh, the, uh, Daiwa J braid, uh, uh, J floor. Yeah, J yeah. floor. You can see my, uh, where's the wrong hand. You can see that hanging right there. Is the spool <laughs> <of> J braid. <laughs> nice. That's, that's my spooling station. <laughs> it's a coat hanger. <laughs> well, and I'm sure if, I mean, if, if you're having to, to put stuff on that clients are using, you're going to figure out what works and what doesn't. A little quicker than maybe even somebody who is just a weekend warrior kind of you know if it's something that your kind of livelihood depends on you're gonna you're gonna know you want to know what what works and what doesn't so yeah and one of the things that i usually recommend to most people is i put a lot of my own line on now but if, if you can go to a shop that can do machine spooled line and they can spool it for you i highly recommend that and if if cost is an issue tell them to put half of your spool to back it up you know half the spool with monofilament and then because you you put 300 yards of line on a reel and you're only casting 150 feet i mean you don't need 300 yards of braid 
you don't need to pay right. because most shop well if they do bulk spools like that and they spool it they'll charge by the by the foot or by the yard and so just tell them you know go half monofilament and they'll tie the braid to that and you'll never see that monofilament until they spool, strip down to re-spool it you know whenever you get around to it so because it can cost upwards of 30 some odd dollars to fill you know a 3000 series spinning real spool if you went straight 30 pound braid it can be 30 40 dollars depending on the braid and the shop that you go to so it gets expensive you know if you bring six reels in you leave them there you know with a pretty pretty fat bill that a lot of people don't think about it. They're like, oh, you know, I'm just going to go have my real, real spool. And then they're like, that'll be $200, please. And you're like, what? $200? And they're like, oh, well, you know, we put, you know, 1,500 yards of line on six spools, you know, or whatever it is. So if, if cost is an issue, definitely go have. And the thing with the machine mount line is that not only is it it's coming off the bulk spool and going onto your spool in, this, in a nice straight way so you don't get as many line twists right off the bat, but you're only paying for what you put on there as opposed to you buy a 300 yard spool in your line in your spool, a 300 yard spool of line and your, your real spool will only hold 250. You've bought 50 yards of braid that you'll never, you're never going to use that. Everybody sticks it in a drawer thinking, Oh, I'll use that someday. And who's, what do you need 50 yards of braid for craft projects? You know? <laughs> <laughs> never right. Use <laughs> right. No, no, for sure. Um, that's, I, that's true. And, and I never thought about that like that. I, but I, I'm sure I have, a couple of spools sitting out in my garage right now that are probably yeah. about 50 yards left, but interesting. <laughs> yep. Cool, man. All right. Well, um, we're about at the hour mark. Um, one thing I was going to ask you, and I like to ask all of my guests who are guides, um, any, um, what's the most common mistake you see from your customers? Uh, like just general fishing wise and, and how do you correct that? Um, the most common mistake is probably, um, not doing what your guide tells you to do. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm really good about just demonstrating things and I'll show my clients how to do something and, and, you know, I'll look over and they're doing it differently and then I'll show them again and, you know, look over and they're doing it differently. And, and I think a lot of people, they won't, they won't do it and they're afraid to ask, you know, cause they, they'll feel stupid or or whatever, you know, if you're unsure, ask, but you know, when, when I tell somebody how to vertical jig, for instance, I'm very specific, you know, I'll tell them, you don't, you're not jigging cod. So no eight foot high jigs, no giant jigs. You want to keep it to four foot or less. And I'll look over and there's six feet, six feet, six feet. And I'll say too much, too much. That's six feet. You want to go four feet, you know, and, and I'll show them this is four feet, you know, your rod is seven feet. So, you know, you can kind of use that as a gauge, you know, what seven feet looks like and go less than that. And so definitely, you know, if you've hired a good guide, they, they have that technique dialed in and just, you just do, do what they tell you to do. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. Um, I think that's uh, good advice. So. Some, some guides are tellers though, you know, so I've, I've fished with guides that they just tell you what to do and expect you to understand how they're saying it. You know, that's why I show them. Like, I will I literally take the rod out of every client's hands when I get them on my boat and say, this is what you want to do. And I show it to them and I give it. it and there, there's always resistance. Like, I have to kind of take it away from them. And I'm like, no, I'm going to show you. And I show them. I don't just say, you know, do this this way and expect them to understand, you know, what I'm talking about. Because some of my clients don't even, don't fish, you know, except maybe once or twice a year. So I don't know after what I'm talking about, you know, let it flutter down. They're like, how do I let it flutter down? I'm like, well, it's kind of doing it on its own, you know. So I'll show them. So that's that's the big thing. And if you're ever on a guided trip and and a guide is trying to explain something to you, best to just just ask them to show you, show you, show me what you mean. Yep. Let no, I, I think that's a great great thing because I I've been on trips before. Uh, I went on a, a striper trip out of the uh, the Susquehanna Flats one time and. The guy basically just handed us the rods and said, hey, uh, you know, he gave us a little bit of like uh, kind of basic, you know, instruction, but it was literally and then he went up and was just driving the boat and we're like, OK, and we really struggled. And obviously we didn't go back with that guide again um, because it, it just wasn't informative. But uh, I've had the exact opposite experience, too, where, you know, the guide was really, really good. 
and told us exactly what we're doing. He's like, all right, you're going to open the bale, let it drop to the bottom, uh, crank up two cranks. And then this is how you work it when you have it there, you know, and, yep. you know, you know, you can really tell the ones who, who enjoy the teaching aspect of it. And, you know, in addition to, you know, the other aspects of guiding. So, yeah, for sure. All right, man. Well, um, that was a ton of great info. So thanks a ton. Um, Wanted to give you an opportunity to, to shout out to folks uh, where they can find you and also uh, any sponsors that you have. Yeah, so I am on most social media channels. You can get to most of those through my website, which is timmoreoutdoors.com. But I'm on, you know, Facebook and Instagram and my YouTube channel. I've been, you know, really putting a lot of efforts into that to try to come up with good content, which is TMO Fishing uh, on YouTube. You can just um, do a YouTube search for that. Um, I'll give a shout out to Daiwa uh, Kittery Trade and Post. They, they, I've sent a lot of people to their website recently to buy things that the, the manufacturers don't seem to have. The ones that you can buy direct from, but Kittery will still have a lot of stuff that other manufacturers are out of. They seem to be able to keep a good stock of stuff. And uh, definitely got to give a shout out to Old Town Canoes and Kayaks because it would be nowhere without them <laughs> for sure. They've been a huge help and the kayaks are amazing. So or, they definitely me, have yeah. some, some cool kayaks, man. I, I've definitely, I I'm in a Hobie Outback right now, but I have looked at that autopilot. Uh, you know, I, uh, it looks totally like it would work perfect for some of the applications I fish. So. Unbelievable. I love, I'm a vertical jig fanatic and I just, put out a second of two, well, a second of either three or four videos um, from last month. One of the marketing people from uh, Old Town and I went to Lake Champlain jigging for Lakers for four days. And we had like 20 mile an hour winds most of the time we were there, which doesn't seem like horrible amount until you get on a lake that's 125 miles long and you get 20 mile, 15, 20 mile an hour winds will cause, you know, three to four footer rollers Right. And we had a two knot current. That's how much wind there was in the lake. Oh my gosh. Um, and we were in spot locks. So definitely if you find my YouTube van, vid, uh, channel, check those couple of videos out. There were a couple from last year too, but the ones from this year are just like crazy weather and crazy fishing. And those, those things were the different, there were no boats out there. We were the only ones, there were no boats. There's, you know, charter boats all over that lake and there were no boats around us the whole time we were there but we were still be able to, to stay out there and fish. So it was actually an advantage over the bigger boats because we could just kind of ride over those swells and the spot lock held us right there all day long. Pretty cool. That's awesome. No, I'm definitely going to uh, have to check that out for sure. So cool, man. Um, well, thanks again. Um, I am definitely interested uh, about having you back on to talk about tidal fishing because, again, that's something uh, I definitely uh, – it's a topic that I've had requests for and um, – something I know zero about. Um, so if you're down for it sometime, I'll reach back out and uh, see if we can have a chat about that. Absolutely. Love awesome. It. Cool. Well, thanks again, sir. And um, everybody, this has been the Bass Fishing for Noobs segment on the Paddle and Pin podcast, where we bring you the techniques, the tricks, and the tips to help you rip more lips. Thanks for tuning in, and we'll catch you next time. Thanks for tuning in to another killer episode on Paddle in Finn. Don't forget to go check out our website at paddle, the letter N, and fin.com. Don't forget to check out the YouTube channel at Paddle in Finn. If you got a question, comment, want to hear from a future guest on a future episode, feel free to email us at paddle, the letter N, and fin at gmail.com. Don't forget to follow us on social media at Paddle in Finn on Facebook and Instagram. Shout out to our show supporters, Angler, the Angler Button, and and app just makes for a better time on the water and creates a virtual logbook for every fishing outing out on the water. Shout out to Rocktown Adventures located in Northern Illinois for all your kayaking, camping, and hiking needs. Shout out to Jigmasters Jigs. When in doubt, get the jig out. Go to jigmasters.com.